Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Kritchmar from the University of California, Irvine. And I want to briefly discuss uh, my field of interest, uh, neurorobotics, and, and share some thoughts uh, from myself and my colleague, Tiffany Hu at HRL Laboratories uh, on neurorobotics, uh, connecting the brain body environment, which happens to be the title of our book, which hopefully is due out this summer. So the neurorobotics approach is a holistic approach. So it combines the brain, body, and behavior. So it forces you to consider how behavior in the environment affects the design of the agent and relies on information and actions coming from the environment. So it's embodied. And it considers in real physical systems the limits of sensory input and motor output. And this has very important uh, implications for how the brain works. And when you test a robot in the real world, uh, you reduce many of the potential biases. Real worlds are complex, they're dynamic, they're noisy, and they don't come with a set of rules. So it provides a more rigorous and realistic test of algorithms. So what is the power of the neurorobotic approach uh, compared to other approaches or complementing other approaches? It's a tool for testing brain theories and increasing our understanding of neuroscience. Uh, so if you follow some sort of brain anatomy and brain dynamics uh, and have that model, you have a way now that with this artificial nervous system to analyze and perturb it. Uh, that cannot be done with present recording technology by a, a wet neurophysiology. But you can also test it under the similar lab conditions that you would in an animal experiment. <clears throat> This provides direct comparisons. And you can take it out of the lab and test it in more natural conditions, which would be hard to do with animals, and see how these brain functions might respond in real world situations. And then there's a, another uh, power of the approach is it may be a means to develop autonomous systems with some level of biological intelligence uh, that, that is not shown by artificial intelligence now. Even though artificial intelligence is made amazing, progress, it still falls short of what uh, real organisms can do. So neuroscience, cognitive science, and biology provide a working model towards these intelligent systems. Now, I'm gonna go through a set of design principles in, the, in a way that Pfeiffer, Rolf Pfeiffer and Josh Bongard did in their book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. So it's inspired some ideas, but it's really, um, grounded in, in what we know about cognitive science and neuroscience. And at the basic level, there's actions and reactions. So how does the agent respond uh, reactively, reflexively, and, and have some sort of short-term plasticity? And, and the, this leads to behavioral repertoires that can be used. And then on a the longer term, there's adaptive behavior, learning and memory over a lifetime. And then important to any organism in the real world or in the real world are behavioral trade-offs. There's opposing motivations and environmental needs, and, and this leads to inter interesting behavior. And what's interesting is they're regulated by very low-level processes in the brain. Uh, neuromodulators and hormone levels uh, really can trigger some of these trade-offs. So let's go through these one by one. Um, first. Divine, the set, first set of design principles is every action has a reaction. So that in, in, involves embodiment and efficiency through cheap design. So on the left is just a, a figure from a, a recent review that, that talks about the efficient way the brain encodes information. And it's incredible how little power the brain needs, about 20 watts, which is the power to uh, run a ceiling fan, uh, but able to do amazing things. There's a whole bunch of tricks, which I won't go into detail now, but I can talk about it another time, uh, that the brain does to make it very efficient, uh, but actually very high in maximizing information. But the body is doing this too. The body is able to um, do a lot of the computation itself. For example, just one example is passive walkers. Uh, by using friction, and gravity to their advantage, you can walk with very little power if you have a human-like gait. And a lot of people who have made passive dynamic locomotion have, have really demonstrated that. And sometimes cheap 
ways that the body is designed can make a huge difference. So on the right is a, a, a segue turned into a soccer playing robot that we developed uh, in my earlier days. And just a simple thing like this plastic hula hoop around it allowed for it to do something very difficult, which is capture a fast moving ball and be able to uh, then decide to pass or shoot with the ball. And another important principle is sensory motor integration. So on the left is a review, uh, a figure from a review by Joaquin Fuster. And you know, we, when I teach systems neuroscience, and I'm guilty of this as, as much as anyone else teaching cognitive science or, or neuroscience, we, we separate things into sensory and motor. And then within that, we separate uh, the sensory system into vision and audition and, and, uh, and touch. Uh, but really the brain does not have these blurred lines, doesn't have these concrete lines, they're blurred. And that was the point Fuster was trying to make that after you get from primary sensory and primary motor uh, cortex, things, there's so much sharing of multimodal and also between sensory motor. So there really is no line or line between these as, as you go further up the streams of these things. And so we should actually be thinking about that and, and neurobotics can do that uh, because then you can't really pocket things in separate. You can't do this sense, think, act. Everything is happening at once and in parallel. And then on the right, sensory motor integration can actually generate information. So this is a nice old, nice study that I always uh, bring up where uh, this was worked by Fitzpatrick and, and Meta, where a robot, which was trying to find this block on a table, which is a very difficult computer vision problem. But as soon as the arm flails around and hits it, the, the block on the table starts moving and it separates figure from ground. So that action generated important sensory information that solved this problem. And so something simple like that by putting together a sensory motor uh, in, in a, a continuous stream can actually solve a lot of difficult problems. Another important concept is degeneracy. So degeneracy is that there's many different ways to get to the same outcome. And you see this throughout biology from very low level cellular level processes like the genetic code or, or protein folding to higher level organism levels, uh, organisms where uh, you have behavioral repertoires and you have different ways of solving a task. And this video on the right is work we did uh, mimicking the Morris water maze in a, in a dry version of it. And this robot was able to solve the Morris water maze in multiple different ways by sometimes bouncing off a blue wall or a red wall or going directly towards it. And then if you looked in its brain, uh, the brain activity was never the same twice, even though it was um, taking similar goal paths and routes towards this, uh, this platform. And you see this also in body movements, that different body movements can get to the same uh, outcome. And so this is something that you want to build into your system because it actually allows for fault tolerance and allows for adaptivity and flexibility. And then lastly, for this first level of design principles, there's multitasking and event-driven processing. So the brain is not working in serial. It's a, it's a highly parallel processor. And there's, this is a work by Prescott's group uh, and they're showing a rat that was actually doing the open field test. And initially it's on the walls, but then after a while, once it's comfortable, it starts exploring the middle and picking up things. And this was a model of basal ganglia. And what the basal ganglia is doing is responding to both sensory events and also internal motivations. And depending on these events, taking the appropriate action or behavior. Uh, and this has uh, parallels to uh, the subsumption architecture that uh, was uh, proposed by Rodney Brooks years ago, but it shows that something like that is going on in the, in the nervous system. Now, going switching to kind of a longer term adaptive behavior. So this is the second set of principles. So adaptive behavior, can allow for changing to learn to do things better in the future. And it starts with value. 
Do you need signals of what is good, bad, or even interesting to shape behavior? And it's interesting to me that many of the things that are signaling value are, are low level processes. And I've highlighted these on the right, just some of the neuromodulators that can signal things like acetylcholine or dopamine or norepinephrine or serotonin. And you can see they're subcortical, but they have broad projections to the rest of the brain. And they signal things like reward, punishment, uh, novelty, uh, a, attention levels, things like that, that are very key to, uh, to actually building up behaviors and also building up learning. And value goes hand in hand with prediction. So on the left is work by June Tani's group where they had different signals that you had to predict and some were bottom up stimuli of predicting where, uh, where this object on the screen should be and the robot has to follow it. And some were top down. After a while, it learned what goals it had or what to predict. And you had top down predictions uh, that would actually allow it to do a better job uh, of moving its arm. And this video on the right is a robot experiment where the robot detects a change in value, a damaged leg, and then does some mental simulation to predict what possible gates might overcome uh, the loss of one of its legs. And by trial and error, but also some internal mental simulation, so doing some prediction, it's able to, over time, learn a whole new gait to adapt to this change in value. And then adaptive behavior really taps into learning and memory. So we're able to learn things over a lifetime and we're able to learn things without forgetting what we've learned in the past. And recent evidence uh, in neuroscience shows that this is done by interplay between the hippocampus or medial temporal lobe and the prefrontal cortex, where if there's something that's novel, that you would use the hippocampus to build up a context that goes with it. But if there's something that fits within a context or what's known as a schema, then you can very quickly consolidate that uh, through interactions between the medial prefrontal cortex. And this experiment on the right is showing how a robot could use a model that has the medial prefrontal cortex and hippocampus to learn two different schemas. One is the classroom, and then this is uh, a break room, and it picks up objects and remembers where objects are. But then when you cue it with something that would go in the classroom, it doesn't forget where objects are in the classroom. It's able to say, well, I remember that context. I remember that schema. Or if you provide it with something that it's never had to pick up before, it knows that a banana should be found on the table in the break room. In this way, in a very neuroscience way, it's able to both build up context, context memory, uh, consolidate memory, and have, that, have these schemas that actually resolve some of the issues with catastrophic forgetting. And it might be a clue of how the brain does this. The last set of design principles I wanna discuss has to do with behavioral trade-offs. Now, life is full of com compromise, compromises. And uh, this requires us to make choices. And our changing needs in a very a changing environment leads to trade-offs that we always need to uh, assess. Uh, and so implementing some of these trade-offs that you see in nature and biology can make the robots more interesting, more relatable, and more realistic. Uh, conflict makes for a good story. And I always find it interesting that many of these trade-offs that are, are so important to cognitive behavior are, are regulated by low-level subcortical neuromodulatory and uh, hormones uh, that set the levels and set the context between reward and punishment, uh, moving a lot, invigorated or withdrawn, uh, uncertainty levels, uh, deciding to explore, exploit, um, feeding and fighting, all sorts of things, uh, which I can go into at some later time. But uh, just to throw that out there, that, that these all these important trade-offs are regulated by uh, hormones and neuromodulatory systems, uh, and, and also by the systems that, uh, 
uh, project to them. So let's look at a couple of these. One is uh, a trade-off between the dopamine level and serotonin level in the brain. So if there's high serotonin, uh, you're more conservative, like this robot that's in an unfamiliar environment and staying close to the, uh, the walls and heading towards uh, a charging station, which serves as, as its nest. But as it becomes more familiar and the stress goes down, the serotonin levels go down and dopamine levels go up, causing it to be more curious, reward-seeking, uh, invigorated, moving more, and going into the middle of the room and exploring novel objects. All right, so let me just take a step back and talk about the needs for actually getting to some level of artificial general intelligence from a neural robotic point of view. Uh, first of all, follow these design principles. Uh, we've, we've worked on these for a number of years uh, and following these, not just one or two, but trying to follow as many as possible might get you to a system that has some level of artificial general intelligence. And that's having something on the short term, being reactionary, having actions, behavioral repertoires, having the ability to learn over long periods of time, assess value, make predictions, and have some of these trade-offs that make interesting behavior. Now, let's talk about some needs that in general, that I think our field needs, uh, and, and start with the near term. Uh, there's certainly a need for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary talent. Uh, neurorobotics touches on cognitive science, computer science, engineering, neuroscience, psychology, and, and, and other areas. And you need to stay on the bleeding edge of these uh, fields. So we need to find people who have the right balance between these disciplines. And there's, there, you must want to conduct field work. So I say this because many, uh, many students and many researchers want to stay by a screen and, and do simulations and, uh, and other benchmarks that, that don't require going out and like a real biologist, testing your robots in the wild. We need now usable and reusable platforms. Uh, usable in that there's a, a, a low level of setup complexity gets started. Uh, and custom setups can make unique contributions, but they take a lot more complexity uh, to, to do, and then they're difficult to replicate. Whereas common setups and using public data sets uh, lower the bar of entry, but then they have the potential of reducing novelty. So that's an issue. And looking at software and hardware. So software, there's a lot of good stuff now in the open source community both um, with simulated environments, real um, simulated environments, or things like the robotics operating system to actually get you started and leverage. Um, simulated environments can be very good for testing uh, when hardware is unavailable. Uh, we have used uh, in this past year during the pandemic, uh, the WeBot simulator uh, to do a lot of testing of our algorithms so that we're, once uh, things open up, that we are ready to go in, in the field with our real robots. Uh, from the hardware level, common robot platforms are really good for reusability. Uh, and we have a, a bunch of common platforms now that, that we've been working with. Uh, sometimes they're not always the best choice, though, if you have some sort of physical interaction. Uh, we've also had to take the step and, and make a custom robot. Uh, and that takes a lot of engineering. So, so there's a trade-off and a need to actually balance between those. Now, on the longer term, uh, in the, this is, I guess, uh, coming from a, a, a professor and researcher over the number of years in the United States. So uh, uh, this is my own experience that the reward structure for academics is short term. Uh, we reward our, um, our new faculty, assistant professors for getting a lot of publications out in a short amount of time. So it doesn't go bode well for long-term planning or taking chances. The funding structure is also short term. Typical grants run anywhere from two to five years, but very rarely more than like, it's more in the two to three range. And these funding structures don't tend to invest in tools and infrastructure. They want discovery science. So if you have, want to provide a tool to the community, you have to kind of slip it in with the discovery science that you're proposing. Now, on the longer horizon and our ambitions, uh, you know, creating ambitious goals for the long term. 
I think we can develop intelligent cognitive systems that can show a range of capabilities. Uh, and this will lead to not only having intelligent systems that, that are really helpful to society and beneficial, but it also allow us to understand the neural underpinnings of cognition. And for all of these uh, goals and needs uh, for neurorobotics, I'd be happy to discuss them in, in much more detail and give you my thoughts on that. All right, so uh, just before I wrap up, that is me on the left, and that is Tiffany Hu on the right, and uh, a student from our lab that recently graduated, Harak Kashyap, and this is uh, the three of us uh, worked very hard on RoboCup uh, in 2019 and, uh, and working on uh, actually introducing some of our ideas to a robot that could work in the house. And if you want any further information, uh, on the right is my website and our, our lab's uh, YouTube channel, so you can see uh, more examples of the robots we've done. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.